All right, let's get into this. The next segment is going to be a segment that I really enjoy uh, discussing um, outside of you know the teaching environment as well. I just you know it's something that I'm really really into, and that happens to be the real estate investments. So looking at real property or real estate from the investment perspective, we're going to be talking about some fundamentals. So I'm happy to be able to do that with some of. Uh, my students, you know, they're brand new to the world of investments and I'm excited. I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce you uh, to various concepts inside of the world of real estate investments. So we'll look at some of the fundamentals. Then we'll get into real estate as an investment and how it sort of compares to the other investment classes. We'll talk about the different investment entities, these, these different structures, things like syndicates, things like real estate investment trusts, sort of how they work. You don't need to know very much in deep. We could go for, you know, couple of college semesters teaching you about some of these entities, uh, but I'm going to give you a nice understanding, enough sufficient for the exam. Then we'll talk about the taxation of real estate investments and how that typically works uh, across the United States. We'll look at an investment analysis of a residence, and then we'll look at an investment analysis of an income producing property. And I'll kind of detail that for you. Now, this income producing property is also something that you typically see in many appraisal modules or appraisal units, but we're gonna be doing that in this particular one because we're looking at real estate as an investment, right? So join me if you will, let's do a quick high level review of the slide decks. We'll kind of look at the things that are gonna be coming up in the particular unit that we're gonna be working in. And then we'll jump into the book. We'll start detailing a bunch of stuff. And then we'll look at some practice exam questions in the snapshot review. I'll see you on the inside. When we come back, we're gonna be looking at unit 18, real estate investments. Looking forward to teaching this one. Okay, smokey dokey. Here we go. All right, so uh, real estate investments uh, is a really fun unit. So, um, and I, I, I really enjoy this particular discipline. It's one of the things I like to geek out about as well. So, and I'm sure a lot of the uh, uh, students that end up taking real estate classes are really interested at the end of the day of potentially maybe buying real estate investment properties and stuff like that. Uh, I can tell you I've been investing for, uh, for since I was 18 years old. Uh, so for me, this is something that I love. I'm excited about. I'm like a little child when it comes down to it. I still have that fascination and that curiosity when it comes to this particular topic and discipline. Uh, and I hope it's a bit uh, you know, infectious. Uh, I hope you all become the, you know, what you're looking for. And if becoming a professional investor is, uh, then it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to this particular subject. So let's get into it. All right. So looking at the slides, we are going to be looking at a couple of different things inside of this unit. Number one, investment fundamentals. Number two, real estate as an investment overall, real estate investment entities, things like syndicates and real estate investment trusts and RUMIX and stuff like that. Then we'll be taking a look at how the taxation works at the investment level. Uh, we'll be, you know, introduce you to things like what is capital gains and things like that. Because, you know, for every investment, we all partake in a percentage of that as it becomes more and more successful, right? So there's this taxation element. Then we'll look at the, in, in, in sort of this residential analysis of uh, investment. And then we'll look at this income producing analysis for investment purposes as well. And it'll kind of go into those and take a peek at all of those things. You'll learn about capitalization rates and how they work and, and we'll get into it. It's going to be cool. All right. From again, a higher level, let's kind of go through a few of these items here inside of the fundamentals. We're going to be talking about characteristics of real estate as an investment. We'll be covering things like real estate investment rewards, the income, the appreciation. What is that? What is leverage? And what are the tax benefits? So we're going to be covering those. And as we're getting into these, these are the basic fundamentals that you see repeated on many uh, practice examinations. So my suggestion is that we're just going to start learning these various vocab phrases that jump into it. We'll talk about its uh, we looked at its upside, things like you know income and appreciation. We have to look at its downside, market risk, business risk, and monetary and financial risk. Uh, the fact that real estate is highly illiquid, right? So it's not a liquid investment. We'll talk about the four principal types of investments, money, equity, debt, and real estate. We'll look at these and define them for you. Then we'll look at two types of real estate investments. We'll look at non-income, one's residence, and then we'll look at income producing. And we'll kind of look and compare the differences in the tax advantages and benefits, the risk versus the reward. We'll take a look at tax treatments of capital gains income. I would pay attention there with the idea that real estate is, has a high level of illiquidity. 
All right. Those are some things that we do uh, definitely see repeated on many practice exam questions. So let's just be mindful of that. Real estate investment entities, there's the direct method of just oh, being an active investor. Then there's syndicates and then there's general partnerships. We'll look at all of these. We'll talk about the real estate investment trust. You definitely want to know what that is. And then we'll define what is a RIMIC, you know, real estate mortgage investment conduit. Okay. So pay attention when we get into these different entities as well. Regarding the taxation of real estate investments, we do see questions on practice exams regarding this stuff. So income producing investments and how they work. How is the gain realized when the property is sold? What is the taxable income, gross income minus allowed expenses and deductions? And the net income from the investments is added to the investor's ordinary taxable income. So we'll talk about how these investments are taxed. We'll talk about cost recovery and what is depreciation for tax purposes. This is another important one that I want you to pay attention to when we get into it. And then we'll briefly discuss what is a depreciable basis and how do the depreciation schedules work. I would also say that this is important when I you hear me talk about 27 and a half years, 39 years. We'll talk about what that means. We'll talk about capital gains and losses. This is an important topic as well. If the sales proceeds exceed the current adjusted basis, then there's a gain. If it's less, then there's a loss. We'll talk about capital gains. We'll talk about the adjusted basis in capital gains with uh, capital improvements, less depreciation. And then we'll look at what is interest and the deductibility of it for income tax purposes. So we'll look at the tax advantages and the deductibility. What is appreciation? We'll talk about that. And then we'll look at some examples of appreciation rates and how these things are going. You might see some basic math here. We'll look at the non-income property tax deductions and what we get for like a residence and how it works, what we can write off. We'll look at the tax liability that happens at sale. And this is important with capital gains and how, it's, uh, how it works. Plus, we'll talk about the capital gains exclusions. And we'll do a sample. All right, which is always very useful when you look at the, you know, the monetary understanding of something. It's where the rubber meets the road. So we'll talk about the gain and what is the tax look like for something like this. We'll look at what is pre-tax cash flow and what is debt service. Debt service is definitely something that you see on investment analysis. Pre-tax cash flow, we'll show you an example of that. Then we'll do an investment analysis of an income property after tax cash flow how it works, how we get to net operating income plus reserves minus interest and minus depreciation. So an example, uh, again, it always useful to kind of see how this whole thing connects together. And then we'll look at how the investment is performing. So we'll get a couple of key performance indicators and teach you what those are, like return on investment, cash on cash return, return on equity. These are the basic ones that most all investors just need to be familiar with. I will explain briefly what discounted cash flow analysis is. And then what is internal rate of return? And then we will get to the classic questions and we will go through those. So join me, if you will, inside the textbook. Let's get into the meat and potatoes, if you will, of this investment unit. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with y'all on this one. This is a lot of fun. Again, investment analysis is a lot of fun. Uh, and just understanding investments, generally speaking, is an exciting piece that we're going to be learning about it. This could be one of those chapters that you go, oh, wow, that's so cool. I didn't know about these things. Sometimes, you know, the theory could be interesting to some folks. Sometimes it could be investments. It could be valuation. It could, so everybody has their own thing. Uh, for this uh, particular subject, the understanding of what investments are, are exciting for me to teach brand new students. So I'm excited to be here. I look forward to seeing you guys inside of the book. Unit number 18, real estate investments coming up next. Okay, let's check out some of these questions for the investment section. Uh, unit number 18. Now, again, these are just a sample. Uh, I just want you to kind of feel and see how I look at these and try to identify what uh, things could be before I even read the question. Um, I like to bucket answers. I like to sort of analyze what's going on uh, and just talk my way through things as I'm learning. Um, and I find that this works alarmingly well, especially with nervous test takers and especially with folks that, you know, know theory uh, well enough, but they still have some, they need a little bit of an edge. 
This typically helps. All right, so let's do this. I'm not being influenced by the question. I'm just going at the answers first. Letter A, gross income minus expenses plus land and building depreciation. Okay. Gross income minus expenses minus land and building depreciation. So letter A said plus land and building depreciation. And letter B said minus land and building depreciation. Both had gross income minus expenses, right? So if you notice, the big difference between these two is this word plus or minus. This is identical to this. And this is identical to that. Interesting, right? One is plus, one is minus. Hey, look, at this point, I'm saying nothing. I'm just kind of analyzing, right? Letter C, gross income minus building depreciation plus land depreciation. So this one says gross income minus building depreciation plus land depreciation. All right, and then letter D says gross income, the same, minus the same, expenses minus building depreciation. All right. So, letter C and letter D both start with gross income, both start with minus. One says building depreciation plus land depreciation. And the other one says building depreciation minus and minus expenses. All right. Now, I'm making an assumption. The assumption I'm making here is that this is some kind of a question that deals with um, calculating income of something, right? So ta taxable income, something like that, right? Something about calculating income uh, or adjusted income of some kind, right? So that's, I can make an assumption there. I don't know yet. Now, I do note that A and B are strikingly similar, except one is plus and one is minus. All right, they both state land and building depreciation. All right, so the first thing, if I remember to my, uh, uh, to my theory, well, land does not depreciate. Only buildings can depreciate. So we cannot uh, obtain cost recovery, which is another way of saying depreciation, if we are dealing with land. So plus land and building depreciation in letter A is an incorrect statement. Minus land and building depreciation is also letter B incorrect statement. You cannot depreciate land, period. So I'm going to be bold and put A and B in a bucket. Right? Even though they were going against one another because of the plus and the minus. Now if I go to letter C, I'm going to say, Gross income minus building depreciation plus land depreciation. Well, we can't depreciate land. So once again, I'm finding something incorrect in the answers. Not saying that that isn't the answer. I'm just saying that I'm finding an incorrect statement. So then I'm going to go and be so bold as to put A, B, and C into a bucket. Now, D could go in the same bucket. We'll see. Gross income minus expenses minus building depreciation. Well, it doesn't mention land depreciation. Now, is this a correct statement as itself? Gross income minus expenses, okay, minus building depreciation. All right. All of that is legit. Now, I would prefer, instead of just expenses, I would say operating expenses. I would prefer that. But I'm going to go ahead and say that D is a correct statement. So I'm going to put D in a bucket by itself. So A, B, and C are in one separate bucket. Why? Because of land depreciation. It doesn't exist. And D is in a separate bucket. So I've put D by itself. Doesn't mean it's the answer. But now I must read the question and determine if that is the valid answer, right? So now, taxable income produced by an income property. All right. So they were looking for some kind of income. Now they're looking for taxable income produced by an income property is... Taxable income is the gross income minus expenses minus building depreciation. Is that taxable? The answer is, yeah, you bet your dollar. All right, so let's see. I'm going to guess D is my answer. Let's see if I'm right. And boom, D. So in this example, we were able to very simply catch 
the test writer's intent before we even got to the question. I hope you see the power in what we're doing there. It's, it's a very interesting approach to taking the test. Um, and I can tell you that there are a lot, lots of you know, high scoring test takers do this particular technique. I hope it serves you well, because what it does is in essence, it strips out the deception. It's Otherwise, you're reading the question and you're, you're like spiraling. You're trying to figure out uh, this or that. And then you're like, wait a minute. If you just looked at it from in terms of what's a correct statement and what's not, and then you bucket and then you validate, it's a much easier way, in my opinion, to approach it. All right, let's try it a little bit faster with you guys. All right, letter A, deduct principal and interest payments from income. Letter B, deduct principal payments from income. Letter C, deduct interest payments from income. And letter D, deduct principal and interest payments from income and capital gain. All right, so let's just look at the, so this is some kind of, a, again, investment question of some kind, I'm assuming, because we're deducting uh, some kind of payment. Let's take a look at all the answers. So in this particular example, we've got deduct principal and interest payments from income, right? So deduct principal and interest payments from income. Letter B is deduct principal payments, again, very similar to A, and principal payments from income, all right? So from income, this from income is similar, and it just says principal payments, okay? And then deduct interest, so we're deducting interest payments from income. Then in letter D, we're deducting principal and interest payments from income and capital gains. So now let's take a look at just the answers. Uh, we learn in a chapter that we never can deduct principal from anything again. So we're looking at uh, a situation here where there's a little bit of misstatement. There's, there's something incorrect. We can never deduct principal. I wish we could, but we can't. So letter A, deducting the principal and interest payments from income isn't, is, isn't, a correct statement is not a correct statement. Letter B, deduct principal payments from income. Can't do it. Unless this is saying pick the incorrect statement, uh, well, then I'm already going to put A and B into a separate bucket together. They go together because they're just incorrect statements. Deduct interest payments from income. Ah, well, that's not, that's correct. We can deduct interest from income. That's one of our benefits for non-income producing residential property, right? We learned about that during the chapter. So letter C is a correct statement. If it's an income statement, looking for that as an answer. So I'm going to put C by itself, A and B in a bucket by themselves together, and C is separate. And then let's look at D, deduct principal and interest payments. Ah, again, look, we're doing that same thing, deduct principal and interest. Cannot do that. So if we're doing that, it's incorrect. So I'm going to add A, B, and D into a bucket by themselves. Not saying they're not, one of those aren't the answer. But I'm telling you that those are incorrect statements, and letter C is a correct statement. Now let's look at the question. As a general rule, in deriving taxable income on an investment property, it is legal to, it is legal to. All right, so it's looking for a correct statement. Well, the only correct statement in this particular group is C, period. So C is my answer. And again, we were able to do this by just looking at the answers. Let's see if we're right. And boom, there we go. All right, let's do you. You can do this. All right, so may be deducted from personal income, may be deducted from the property's income, may be deducted from the sales price for capital gains tax purposes or for gains tax purposes, may be deducted from the adjusted basis for gains tax purposes. So this is some kind of a deduction or tax basis question, right? So this all may be deducted from, may be deducted from, right? So they're all saying that. May be deducted from personal income, may be deducted from the property's income, may be deducted from the sales price for gains tax purposes, and may be deducted from the adjusted basis for gains tax purposes. All right, so maybe I don't know. What if I was in a situation where I'm just not 100% sure? Let's read the question. An investment property seller pays $14,000 in closing costs. So closing costs are, these costs are, can they be deducted? So we know the answer is yes, because clearly all four of these answers are telling us that we can deduct it. Now the question is, is, from what? Personal income, 
from the property's income, from the sale price of the gains for gains tax purposes, or for the adjusted basis for gains tax purposes. Now, in this particular situation, we just kind of have to know enough theory to be able to get it there. Can it be deducted from the property's income? So it cannot be deducted from the property's income. So I'm going to say no to B. Can it be deducted from the personal income? Or can it be deducted from the sales price for gains tax purposes? Really, at the end of the day, when we are buying something, the cost of closing is something that we can deduct from the sales price for gains tax purposes. So letter C is a correct statement. Maybe deducted from the adjusted basis for gains tax purposes. Well, we don't really deal with the closing costs with the adjusted basis. We deal with the adjusted basis on the sale not on the purchase. This is asking us an investment property seller, a property seller pays $14,000 in closing costs. These costs are. So the question here is really, is it, are we dealing with the adjusted basis or are we dealing with the gains, the sales price for tax purposes? So I'll give you a second. The answer is, the answer is C. All right, cool. So may be deducted from the sales price for gains tax purposes. So again, it's a little bit of theory. It's a little bit of being able to figure out what's going on, maybe isolating some answers. And in some situations, we might have to take an educated guess. Number four, cost recovery expense, interest expense, loan principal payments, net operating income. All of these are things, so I can't bucket them separately. I can say that letter A refers to some expense. Letter B refers to some expense. That's a similarity. Loan principal payments, which technically is an expense, right? Payments. Uh, and the net operating income. So there's income there. So that's sort of the one that's different. But it doesn't mean it's the answer. I'm just, these are all legit things. So now let's read the question. Cash flow is a measure of how much pre-tax or after-tax cash an investment property generates. That's the cash flow. To derive cash flow, it is therefore necessary to exclude what do we exclude when it comes to cash flow? I'm going to give you a second to think about it. And the answer is, oh, let me shrink that. I apologize. There's that right there. My bad. And the answer is, boom, A, cost recovery expenses depreciation. So when we're dealing with cash flow, all right, and cash flow is a measure of how much pre-tax or after-tax uh, cash an investment property generates. To derive cash flow, it is therefore necessary to exclude, when we're trying to figure out what cash flow is, we have to exclude the, the depreciation. Uh, and you'll learn that inside of unit number 18. All right. That is a sampling of some of the questions. What I would focus on are those things, those things inside. So now you would take these questions and I would go back into the book and I would re sort of learn what, what some of these phrases are, looking at the answers, going back, trying to find those pieces and trying to find the truth inside of the questions. And I would reverse engineer my studies that way. So I would absolutely leverage questions. This is what you want to do as you're studying. So many people ask, uh, hey, D, how do you study for this? Well, you can learn the theory. That's one way to do it. But the only really way to, to do this is you have to incorporate questions and use them as a foundation. And as you're performing on you know the quizzes, you go back and then you reverse engineer and research. And you'll be able to search through phrases like you might be able to go through and search cash flow in the videos it'll take you right to that section you might be able to go pre-tax or after tax and then you can figure that out and then you can figure you know to derive cash flow you could type in derive cash flow as a phrase and see where it takes you inside of the videos or the book and that's going to help you get through it you can even just do a blind google search as well and a lot of this stuff is going to be found now the one problem with google is there's a lot of professionals quote unquote out there that misstate things uh, so you want to be careful about the information that you're getting from the internet. You have to make sure it's credible and legit. But uh, at least if you're going, stick with one or two credible sources and it'll help you get through the majority of stuff. All right. That was it. Questions? I'll see you in the next unit coming up soon. All right. So real estate investments, this particular section, we're going to learn a ton about the investment fundamentals. And, you know, what's a good thing to do is I would say, 
This section is going to be a lot of blue uh, and a lot of green. Uh, I think that this is a, a chapter that would bear repeating uh, and learning. Okay, there's going to be some vocab phrases that you're going to need to know for your exam, for sure. But, you know, as we're getting into investments and stuff, this is one of the big reasons why a lot of students get into uh, learning this formally uh, and, and, and brave the world of pre preparation for an exam uh, just to sort of get their bearings on real estate investments. So let's check out this next section. I'm super excited to do this. Uh, we just went through the key point reviews. Let's get in, if we will, to real estate investments, unit number 18, and that's where we're going to be starting here uh, and sort of get into this. The first thing we'll do is we'll lay some groundwork, some foundations, the investment fundamentals. Some of these vocab phrases are definite phrases that you will see on examinations. Then we'll talk about real estate as an investment, real estate investment entities, things like you know real estate investment trusts, uh, partnerships, REMIX. We'll define them briefly. Right, and we're gonna go heavy in depth here. Then we'll talk about taxation, and then we'll do two investment analysis. We'll do one investment analysis inside of a residential property, uh, and then we'll look at an income-producing property uh, and kind of how we approach that. All right, so let's jump in. The first thing we're gonna do is let's say, lay some groundwork, uh, and uh, is it groundwork, ground rules, foundations? You know what I'm saying? All right, so here we go. I say dumb things sometimes, just forgive me. All right, the investment characteristics, rewards, risks, and type of investments inside of the world of investment fundamentals. Let's talk about characteristics. Uh, the idea of investment is you know, pretty simple. As the book says, take something of value and put it to work in some way to increase its value over time. With any investment, one wants the original investment to grow without losing it. This idea is also called the conservation of capital. Unfortunately, no investment is truly secure. As we all know, external conditions change and the investment itself can change. Even if you do nothing with it, its value does not remain constant. And that's the, you know, the way that investment logic works. And that's in a really smart uh, sort of intro. There's risk versus return. The general rule in investments is that the safer the investment, the more slowly it grows in value. The more you want it to grow the gain, and the more quickly, the more you must risk losing this thing. How much do you want to earn? How much are you willing to risk to earn it? Rewards in investing correspond directly to the degrees of risk. And I want to put that in blue. In regards to management, another aspect of investment is the amount of attention that you have to pay to make something work. You can deposit cash into a passbook account and forget about it in essence. You can use your cash to buy a business, then run the business yourself and make your assets grow and earn. How much do you want to be involved in managing your investments? That's the next question. How much work do you want to put in? Now, another way that you can look about management is active versus passive. Many times investors will use that phrase. Active management means you're actively engaged in the day-to-day -day operations potentially, or you have some direct contributory factor that's in, uh, inserted in so that you can grow. Uh, passive income is like buying a share of Apple uh, and uh, kind of letting Apple do what Apple does. Uh, and you happen to be an owner of Apple because you own some shares, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it's their uh, operations. They have management in place. They have uh, everything for that machine to operate. And uh, whether you own the share or somebody else owns the share is of no consequence to Apple. Liquidity. This is an important one I do want to mark. The issue of exchangeability is an important one in investments. How easy is it for you to recover your invested resource without loss and exchange it for one that you want? If there is a market for the type of resource you have, other people want to buy and sell it for themselves. Your investment is liquid. Right. Is there a market for it? And your investment is liquid. The most liquid form of financial investment is generally cash, since cash itself a medium of exchange and people always want it. The more illiquid investment is the one which takes a longer time to exchange for something that you prefer to own. How long are you willing to wait to recover your invested resources and its earnings? All right, so the the idea of something being more illiquid is one that takes a longer time to exchange for something. All right, so liquidity. Cash compared to think about real estate. 
You know, think about how quickly we can sell something in a market, how long it takes to con you know consummate that transaction. Uh, and then you'll begin to see that real estate is illiquid. It can't be liquidated as fast. It can be liquidated, but it takes a little bit of time. Rewards. The basic aim of a financial investment is to increase one's wealth, to add value to what you have. This can occur in several different ways. Number one, a reward would be income. An investment can generate income in some way on a periodic basis. You may consume this cash, spending it for goods and services that when used up, have no further value. Or you may use that cash to put into another investment. And that's one of the benefits of investing. Appreciation. Your invested asset itself may gain value over time because of an increase in market demand for it. When you sell or exchange it for something else you prefer to have, you get more than you originally put into the investment. So you want to know what appreciation is. Leverage. You may pledge the value of your resource to borrow funds in order to make an investment that is larger than your own resource permits you to do directly. The small resource is used to lever or to make larger investments and thus increase your opportunity to benefit from income, appreciation, and other of rewards of investment. So if your asset is uh, has the ability to be leveraged, uh, then we can buy something. So, you know, in other words, real estate is highly leverageable, which, uh, you know, because we have the capital markets for it, you know, a house where you have this much money and you and you can buy a house that's worth this much. Uh, why? Because somebody's willing to loan you the money if you qualify uh, to be able to bridge the difference between the purchase price and what you have to be able to buy it for. So one of the great uh, aspects of real estate as an investment is it's highly leverageable. Another killer advantage is tax benefits. Some investments receive treatments under the tax laws that enable the investor to reduce or defer the amount of taxes owed. Tax dollars you don't have to pay are dollars you have available for some other use, such as consuming or furthering investing. So there are tax benefits, appreciation, income. All right. So these are all of these leverage. All right. So these are all the rewards for investing. Now, with the pursuit of rewards, there is risk. Investment risk comes with a variety of general sources, including the market, business operations, and the value of money, the changes in the interest rate. So these are all the different risk factors. I'm going to mark that for you all in blue. Remember, blue is just read through ones. Green might be appropriate for exam questions. As you're going through stuff, you might see me mark various things. And the reason why is I, I might feel that, hey, this could be a relevant uh, or turned into a test question potentially. And that's sort of how I'm looking at it. Market risk. The first one, changes in the demand for your invested resource may cause your investment to lose value and become illiquid. So there is good old fashioned market risk coming up with risk. And there's business risk. Changes in the operation of a business with which your investment is connected may reduce or eliminate the income and appreciation earnings capacity of your investment. For example, interest rates may go up. And if money is more expensive, then it's less desirable to borrow. Your buying capacity might reduce, thus throwing you out of the ability to be able to buy a property in the range that you initially thought you want or you were able to do. Uh, so there could be this business risk. You know, the mortgage markets are the business. And there's uh, the, because rates are going up, now there's a risk in borrowing and then we kind of have these issues. All right. So business risk could, could come in. Purchasing power risk in this above example that we just talked about the mortgage markets. Now your purchasing power is at risk. Changes in the value of money as an exchange medium, such as through inflation, may decrease the practical value of your invested resource. I'm going to highlight this whole thing in blue. There's financial risk. Changes in financial markets, particularly in interest rates, may reduce the value of your investment by making it less desirable to others and to making it more expensive for you to maintain. An investment may fail to produce any or all of the desired investment rewards listed earlier. The expected income may not be realized. The invested asset may fail to appreciate as expected. It may even decline in value. Perhaps even worse, you may be called on to add to your investment just to keep it in place. In uh, Your leverage may turn against you, becoming a negative leverage. This is a situation when your cost of borrowing funds to make the investment becomes greater than the income that the investment returns to you. And finally, your expectation of tax advantages may be disappointed. Tax laws are constantly changing. So these are the downsides of investing. So it's important to understand 
things like negative leverage. Your uh, asset loses value. You're throwing good money after bad. Tax code changes, regime change, which could lead to tax code changes. So again, I'm gonna, you're not going to mark it necessarily in uh, green, but I think that this is bears worth reading at least one more time. All right. Now, when we come back, let's get into the different types of investments. Now that we looked at the risk versus the reward of sort of what investing is. Okay, let's look at the different types of investments. Four of the more important types of investments are investments in money, equity, debt, and real estate. Let's highlight that in green. Again, uh, I, I, again, I think about these things in terms of can I uh, write a test question potentially? You know, all the four, the four, all the following are uh, investment uh, uh, types uh, accept kind of things, right? Money and investments. Let's take a look at each one a little bit more specifically. Uh, a money investment is one in which the basic forms of investment remains money. Examples are deposit accounts, certificates of deposit, money funds, and annuities. The basic reward for money investments come from the form of interest. Money investments are relatively safe with correspondingly conservative rates of return. So there's money investments. Then there's debt investments. A debt investment is one in which an investor buys a debt instrument. Examples are bonds, notes, mortgages, and bond mutual funds. The basic reward comes in the form of interest. Debt investments are generally riskier than money investments and less risky than stocks or real estate. Right? So there's debt investments. And there's equity investments. An equity investment is one in which an investor buys an ownership interest in a business concern. Examples are stock and stock mutual funds. The basic reward comes in the form of dividends and appreciation of share value. Equity investments are generally riskier than money and debt instruments. Then we have real estate investments. Real estate investments is one in which an investor buys real estate for its investment benefits rather than primarily for its utility. It's definitely something I would like you to know. It may have the features of both an equity and debt investment, depending on the type of real estate involved, and numerous other factors, such as the types of interest one owns. Real estate investors may invest in an income-producing property or non-income-producing properties. So there are two types. There are income or non-income-producing properties. Let's highlight these. I want you to know what is a non-income-producing and what is an income-producing. It's fairly intuitive, but we can. I think highlighting it is important. A residential property uses... Uh, as an investor's primary residence. The basic reward beyond the enjoyment of use comes in the form of appreciation. There may also be some tax benefits depending on how the purchase was financed. So that's a residential property to live in. And then the second type of uh, real estate property is income producing properties. A property owned specifically for the investment reward it offers. Examples are multifamily, residential properties, retail stores, industrial, office buildings, etc. Rewards come in any and all forms mentioned earlier. Income, appreciation, leverage, and tax advantages. All right, great. Now let's move into real estate as an investment. And looking at real estate specifically, risk and reward, which we looked at the big picture of risk and reward just a few moments ago, illiquidity of real estate and management requirements. Remember, those were some of the elements of risk that we had to throw in. There's potentially more active uh, management involved inside of the real estate investments. All right, so real estate investments participate in general risks and rewards of all, as, uh, of all investments. However, real estate investments are often and complex. They are also distinguished by their lack of liquidity and by the amount of management that they typically require. I'll highlight real estate investments are distinguished. In addition, each investor has specific aims and circumstances that affect the viability of any particular real estate investment for that individual. Licensees who lack expertise in that area of real estate investment analysis should refer to potential investors to a competent advisor. That's important to note. You don't want to give investment advice unless you are qualified to do so. Nevertheless, a licensee should be familiar with the basis or the basics of real estate as an investment. And so here is some of the basics, the risk and the reward. Capital put into real estate is always subject to the full range of risk factors, market conditions, income, shortfalls, uh, negative leverage, and tax law change, and poor overall return. 
Market demand for a specific type of property can decline. For example, a business district's retailers may vacate stores in an area in order to obtain better space in a new shopping center. Market downturns leave the income property investors with an unmarketable property or one in which can only be released at a loss of some portion of the original investment. Thus, the expected reward from income or appreciation may never be obtained. Another risk of the investment property is the cost of development and operations. If startup costs or ongoing operational costs exceed rental income, then the owner must dip into additional capital resources to maintain the investment until its income increases. If an income does not rise or if the costs do not decline, then the investor can simply just run out of money. Leverage is a constant risk in real estate investments. If the property fails to generate sufficient revenue, the costs of borrowed money can bankrupt the owner. Just as development and operating costs can, investors often overlook the fact that leverage only works when the yield on investments exceed the cost of borrowed money. That is some wise advice. Leverage is a constant risk in real estate investments. Tax law is an ongoing risk in long-term real estate investments. If the investor's tax circumstances change or if the tax laws do, the investor may end up paying more capital gains and income taxes than planned, undermining the return on the investments. If an investor needs to consider carefully the value of such potential tax benefits as deductions for mortgage interest, tax losses, deferred gains, exemptions, and tax credits for certain types of real estate investments. So again, an investor needs to consider carefully these things. I'm not going to put that in green, but I would put that in blue. I think that that's an important one to just read over. In consideration uh, is opportunity costs. Opportunity costs is the return that an investor could earn on capital invested with minimal risk. We're always comparing investments that are riskier with investments that are safer and then calculating and weighing out opportunity costs. If the real estate investment with all its attended, uh, attended risk uh, cannot yield a greater return than an investment elsewhere involving less risk, then the opportunity cost is too high for the real estate investment. Despite all of the risks, real estate remains a popular investment vehicle because historically the rewards have outweighed the risks. Real estate has proven to be relatively resistant to the adverse infl inflationary trends that have hurt money, debt, and stock investments. In addition, real estate has proven to be a viable investment in view of the economy's continued expansion over the last 50 years. Illiquidity. Definitely something I want you to know. Compared with other classes of investments, real estate is relatively illiquid. That could be a test question right there. Even in the case of liquidating a single-family residence, one can expect a marketing period of at least several months in most markets. In addition, it takes time for the buyer to obtain financing and to complete all of the other phases of closing of the transaction. Commercial and investment properties can take much longer depending on the market conditions. Leases, construction, permitting, and a host of other factors are also contributing to this. If the investor is in a hurry to dispose of such an investment, they can expect to receive a lower sales price that may be ideal. Compared with the ease of drawing money out of a bank, selling stocks, you know, I mean, basically it's so much easier to just get, you know, sell a bunch of stocks at a, a couple keystrokes, right? With real estate and other risk factors, management requirements. Real estate tends to require a high degree of investor involvement in management of the investment. Even raw land requires some degree of maintenance to preserve its value, drainage, fencing, payments of taxes, and periodic inspections. Improved properties often require extensive management, including repairs, maintenance, on-site leasing, tenant relations, security, and fiscal management. So we're talking about some pretty hefty management requirements when it comes down to real estate as an investment. Now, when we come back, what I want to do is I want to talk about real estate investment entities and talk about, you know, obviously there's the direct method where we just buy something for ourselves or we can syndicate and partnership and or we can build invest into a real estate investment trust or we can uh, invest into a real estate mortgage investment conduit of some kind these are all investment entities and they're coming up all right let's talk real estate investment um, entities and the first way that we buy real estate as an entity is directly individuals corporations or other investor entities may invest as an active investor in property by, by basically buying it directly uh, and taking responsibility for the day-to-day -day management and operation of the property so that's direct 
That's pretty easy. Nothing big there. Um, so, you know, maybe it, it could be one of those, uh, all of the following are methods to invest in real estate, except, you know, so direct is one way. Syndicate and partnerships. A real estate syndicate is a group of investors who combine resources to buy, develop, and or operate property. I would want you to know what a syndicate is. I think that that's important. A general partnership is a syndicate in which all the members participate equally in managing the investment in the profits and losses that it generates. The group designates a trustee to hold title in the name of the syndicate. So a general partnership can hold title to real estate. A limited partnership is a syndicate in which general partners organize, operate, and is generally responsible for the partnership's interest in the property. Limited partners invest money in partnerships but do not participate in operating the property. These part uh, partners are passive investors. So I do want you to know this as well. So general partners and limited partners, and they are both syndicates. It's important to note back here, by the way, that limited partners have are more passive investors. So these limited partners are passive investors, right? Something that is, uh, you know, available as an investment vehicle is something called a real estate investment trust, all right? REITs, R-E-I-T. You definitely want to know what REIT stands for. In a REIT, investors buy certificates in the trust, and the trust in turn invests in mortgages or other real estate. So you want to know what they are. Investors receive income according to a number of shares that they own. A trust must receive, must receive at least 75% of its income from real estate to qualify as a REIT. And if certain other conditions are met, the trust does not have to pay any corporate income taxes. So that's something you want to know. And the, the other one here is something called a real estate mortgage investment conduit or REMIC. A REMIC is a kind of partnership entity formed to hold a fixed pool of mortgages that are secured by real property. The entity issues two kinds of interest. Holders of residual interest are treated for tax purposes as partners, and holders of regular interest are regarded as owning debt instruments. Income or losses received by regular or residual interest holders is treated as a portfolio income or loss and is not included in determining losses from passive activities. Now, of this, do you need to know much here? You just need to know what REMIC stands for. And it's a kind of partnership formed to hold a fixed pool of mortgages secured by real estate. That's all you need to know. So let's keep that simple. We can talk about these structures, REITs and REMIX, uh, you know, for semesters at college. Now, a major piece of the puzzle is in understanding the taxation of real estate uh, as an investment. And when we come back, what we're going to do is we're going to look into the taxable income, cost recovery, gains on sales, interest and in passive activities. All right, let's talk about taxation, all right? Taxation regarding real estate investments, right? We talked about in another unit, we spoke of taxation in real estate taxes, like ad valorem taxes. But here, let's talk about taxable income, cost recovery, gains on a sale, interest, and passive activities. Real estate investments are taxed on the income that they produce and on the increase in value or gain when the investment is sold. So when they are sold, it triggers the gain, these forms of taxation are distinct from ad valorem taxes of real estate, not to be confused with, you know, real property taxes that the state imposes. Taxable income. From investments, uh, from investment real estate is the gross income received minus any expenses, deductions, or exclusions that the current tax law allows. And that's what's considered taxable income. Taxable income from real estate is added to the investor's other income and taxed at the investor's marginal tax rate. The investment analysis of an income property section below gives more details. So let's take a look at this. We don't have to become taxing experts here for this exam. You just need to get an understanding of it. Again, we're looking for sort of fundamentals and foundations and vocab phrases, things like that. That's what I would focus on. I wouldn't worry about getting everything. Now, in practice, down the road, as a professional, you're going to want to start to understand this a lot better. You're not giving tax advice. You're recommending an accountant and appropriate uh, attorneys and, and such uh, for professional legal advice. But I would say that you're going to want to at least understand the mechanics of how all of this stuff typically works. All right, so let's get into the next one. What is cost recovery? This is an important concept that I definitely want you all to get. All right, so with cost recovery or depreciation, 
allows the owner of income property to deduct a portion of the property's value from gross income each year over the life of the asset. Huh, you say. Tell me more. Okay. All right, so the life of the asset and the deductible portion are defined by law. In theory, the owner recovers the full cost of the investment if it is held to the end of the asset's economic life as defined by the Internal Revenue Service. At the time of selling the asset, the accumulated cost recovery is subtracted from the investment's original value as a part of determining taxable capital gain. Cost recovery is also allowed only for income properties and that portion of non-income properties which is used to produce income. It applies only to improvements. Land cannot be depreciated. The part of a property which can be depreciated is called the depreciable basis. I want you to know this for your exam. Depreciation schedules. Residential rental properties are depreciated over a period of 27 and a half years. The basic annual deduction for such properties is 3.63% with adjustments for the month of tax year in which the property was placed in service. Non-residential income properties placed in service after 1994 are depreciated over a period of 39 years. The basic annual percentage is 2.564%. The proper method of depreciation should be determined in consultation with the qualified tax advisor. What I want you to know for test purposes, is with depreciation schedules, residential rental properties over 27 and a half years, and then commercial properties or non-residential properties over 39 years. You don't have to know the basic percentages that are applied year over year, which is this 3.636 uh, and these 2.564 respectively. But I want you to know that bit here that we highlighted in green. So you want to know that. So what are they saying is the economic life is 27 and a half years from the date of the service started from the year of the service. So if each year you take the value of the asset and you get 3.636 if it's a piece of residential property, you figure out what that number is and that you can subtract Cost recovery is allowed only for income properties. Basically, it allows the owner of income properties to deduct a portion of the property's value from gross income each year over a year of the life of the asset. So the life of the asset, quote unquote here that you see in green, is 27 and a half years if it's residential and 39 years if it's commercial. And again, remember, we always want to recommend a qualified tax advisor. I'm going to put that in blue. All right, so that's the depreciation schedule and cost recovery, which is also known as depreciation. When real estate, whether income or non-income, is sold, a taxable event occurs. If the sales proceeds exceed the original cost of the investment, subject to some adjustments, there is a capital gain that is subject to tax. If the sales proceeds are less than the original cost with adjustments, then there is a capital gain. Loss. So you want to know what a gain is and what a loss is for exam purposes. That's something you definitely want to know. An investor can sometimes defer the reporting of gains or losses and hence taxation of gains by participating in an exchange of like-kind assets. That could be a dollar-for-dollar -dollar test question. The legislation that deals with this kind of exchange is contained in Section 1031 of the IRS Code. These tax-deferred exchanges are sometimes called 1031 exchanges or Starker exchanges, named for an investor who won the case against the IRS. To qualify under Section 1031, there must have been a legitimate exchange of the assets involved. The property being transferred must have been held for productive use in trade or business or held as an investment and must be exchanged for property that will also be used in a trade or business or be held as an investment. Tax on gain is deferred until the investment or business property is sold and not exchanged. All right, so tax on the gain for a 1031 exchange is paid when the property is sold, not exchanged. So we're able to defer capital gains in tax uh, for some time as we roll it into another investment property. 
Now, just as an aside, if some of this is a little still thick for you, go back and read over it. You don't need to have a, an amazing understanding of this. I'm kind of giving you this, uh, you know, um, quick view of what these are just for exam purposes. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, all of these can be subjects that you study for quite some time. All right. All right. So interest mortgage interest incurred by loans to buy, build, or materially improve a primary or secondary residence is deductible from gross income. So another deduction that we have is mortgage interest. The interest on a home equity loan may be deducted only if the loan is used to buy, build, or substantially improve uh, the home that secures the loan. Principal payments on a loan are not deductible. All right, so the interest is for income properties that are held as investments, interest on debts incurred to finance investments is deductible as an investment interest up to the amount of net income received from the property. All right, so let me read that again to you. For income producing properties that are held as investments, interest on debts incurred to finance the investment is deductible as investment interest up to the amount of the net income received from the property. So let's say if a property is netting like, you know, $10,000 a month, then we can deduct interest, you know, as an in, in, is investment interest up to the amount, up to that amount uh, and no greater. All right, great. And then the final thing here that I want to talk about is passive activities. Passive activities are business activities in which the taxpayer does not materially participate, including uh, in interest in, in limited partnerships and rental activities. Losses from such activities may be used to offset income from other passive activities. Passive losses with certain limitations may be carried forward to the future years or accumulated and deducted from capital gains at the time of sale. So, Passive activities are business activities in which the taxpayer does not materially participate, included in interest in limited partnerships or rental activities. Losses from such activities may be used to offset income from other passive activities. So I just want you to get an understanding. Read this one time, and I think that that's fine to understand what passive losses are. All right. That was the taxation piece. Uh, again, just an understanding of what's going on. We talked about capital gains, how they're basically calculated. We talked about uh, the uh, uh, what cost recovery is and depreciation, uh, looking at what is income and taxable. We looked at mortgage interest, and we found out that principal uh, of the loan is not deductible. Then we're going to get into investment analysis of a residence coming up next. Okay, so let's check out an investment analysis of a residence, and we'll cover things like appreciation, deductibles, tax liability, and gains exclusions, and we'll see how that looks as far as an investment analysis. All righty. So the idea here as we're getting into this is just to get an, an overall understanding of what's happening. If there's anything appropriate, I'll make sure to highlight it. So an investment analysis examines the economic performance of an investment. The analysis includes cost, income, taxation, appreciation, and return. Let's highlight that. A property acquired and used as a primary residence is an example of a non-income property. If a portion of the residence is used for business, i.e. home office, this portion only may be treated as an income property for tax purposes. That is something I definitely want you to know for your test. So again, what is a primary residence where you're legally domiciled, okay? Uh, it would be considered a non-income property. However, if a portion were used for business, then that would be treated as an income property for tax purposes. Since by definition, a non-income property does not generate income, its value as an investment must come from one or more of the other sources, appreciation, leverage, or tax benefits, because it's not making income, right? So that's one of the things. I'm just going to highlight that as well. I think if you understand this few paragraphs, I think it's pretty useful. So again, appreciation is the increase in value of an asset over time. A simple way to estimate appreciation on a primary residence is to subtract the price originally paid from the estimated current market value. You definitely want to know what appreciation is. So it's current value less the original price, and that's your total appreciation. For example, if a house were bought for $300,000, it is estimated market value now is four hundred. dollars It is appreciated by $100,000. So pretty straightforward. Nothing too crazy here. Original price, we bought it for three. Current market, it's now worth four. How much appreciation did we realize? $100,000. 
Total appreciation can be stated as a percentage increase over the original price by dividing the estimated total appreciation by the original. Let's take a look at this percentage example. The house in the last example has appreciated by 33%. So what was the total appreciation divided by the original price equals the percentage appreciated? So in this example, the original purchase price was $300,000. The appreciated amount was $100,000. Remember from the example above, the current market value were $400,000, so the total appreciation was $100,000. And when you do that, you get 33%. All right, so you want to know how to be able to do this as well. Let me highlight this for you. Excellent. To estimate the percentage of annual appreciation, divide the percentage appreciated by the number of years the house has been owned. So we look at this formula now. Now we're getting to annual appreciation. And I want you to know how to do this. The way we do this is we take the percentage of total appreciation and we divide it by the years owned. And that equals your percentage appreciation per year. So the house in the previous example has been owned for three years. The annual appreciation has been 11%, or 33%, and you know divided into three years. And when we get that, we get 11% of appreciation per year. So how much has it gone up year over year over year? What's the total amount of appreciation? And then we can figure that, and then we figure out how much over year over year. All right, great. So just these examples are useful. So looking for annual appreciation and then looking for uh, the total appreciation and figuring that out, that's all useful. Deductibles. The primary tax benefit available to the owner of a non-income property is the annual deduction for mortgage interest. The portion of annual mortgage payments that goes to repay the principal must be subtracted to determine the amount paid for interest. Principal repayment is not deductible. Furthermore, depreciation is not allowed for non-income properties. This is all important. We cannot depreciate a primary residence. So the primary deduction happens to be the mortgage interest, okay? We, got, we can't deduct principal, but just the interest portion. Uh, we typically get a statement at the end of how much interest you paid, and that portion is deductible. All right, good. So there's some deductibility there. What about tax liability? Well, the seller of a principal residence may owe tax on capital gains that resulted from the sale. The IRS defines gain on the sale of a home as the amount realized from the sale minus the adjusted basis of the home sold. What's the amount realized? The amount realized, also known as net proceeds from the sale, is expressed by the formula. The sales price, less the cost of the sale, equals the amount realized. The sales price is the total amount the seller receives for the home. This includes money, notes, mortgages, or other debt the buyer assumes as part of the sale. The cost of sale includes brokerage commissions. Let me highlight this here. What is the sales price? This includes all money, notes, mortgages, and other debts the buyer assumes as part of the sale. That's the sales price. Okay, so the sales price up here. And then what is the cost of the sale? Well, the cost of the sale includes the brokerage commissions, the commissions to us, relevant advertising, legal fees, seller paid points, and other closing costs. Certain fix-up expenses, as discussed further below, can be deducted from the amount realized to derive an adjusted sales price for the purposes of postponing taxation on gain. For example, Larry and Mary sold their home for $350,000. Their selling costs include the commission they paid to broker Betty and amounts paid to inspectors, a surveyor, and the title company amounted to 10% of the selling price or $35,000. The amount they realized from the sale, therefore, is $315,500. So that's the example that they give you on trying to figure that out. Basis, uh, the adjusted basis, the basis is a measurement of how much 
is invested in the property for tax purposes. Assuming that the property was acquired through purchase, the beginning basis is the cost of acquiring the property. Cost includes cash and debt obligations and such other settlement costs as legal and recording fees, abstract fees, surveys, charges for installing utilities, transfer, taxes, title insurance, and other amounts that the buyer pays for the seller. So these are the costs associated with that. So again, costs we just looked at above. Just read through that. The beginning basis is increased or decreased by certain types of expenditures made while the property is owned. Basis is increased by the cost of capital improvements made to the property. So this is something that I do want you to know. Assessments for local improvements such as roadways and sidewalks also increase the basis. Examples of capital improvements are putting in an addition, paving a driveway, replacing a roof, adding central heating and air, uh, and rewiring a home. These are all capital improvements. Basis is decreased by any amounts the owner received for such things as easements. The basis formula for adjusted basis is the beginning basis plus capital improvements minus exclusions, credits, or other amounts received gives us our adjusted basis. For example, Mary and Larry originally paid $200,000 for their home. They spent an additional $10,000 on a new central heating and cooling unit. The adjusted basis at the time of selling is therefore $210,000. What's the gain on the sale? The gain on the sale of a primary residence is represented by the basic formula. Amount realized net sales proceeds minus the adjusted basis equals the gain on the sale. So that's a formula I want you to know. The gain on sale, if it does not qualify for an exclusion under certain uh, the current tax law, is then taxable. So look at Exhibit 18.1, the gain on the sale. The selling price of an old home was $350,000. The selling costs were $35,000. The amount realized was $315,000. The beginning basis of the old home was $200,000. We improved the property by adding in some capital improvements of $10,000. Gives us an adjusted basis of the old home at $210,000. The amount realized was $315,000 after costs minus the adjusted basis of $210,000. The gain on the sale is $105,000. In the case of Mary and Larry, their capital gains was $315,000 minus $210,000 or $105,000. They will owe tax on this amount in the year of the sale unless they qualify for the exclusion that's described right below coming up next. All right, so when we left Larry and Mary, our power couple, what ended up happening was they had a gain, right, from after, even after we adjusted base it up, and then we had the, uh, the sales price after the expenses. So we had a gain of about $105,000. Now, if this is their primary residence, could there be something known as an exclusion? So primary residents are given this gains tax exclusion, depending on sort of what's going on in the marketplace. Tax law provides an exclusion of $250,000 for an individual taxpayer and $500,000 for married taxpayers filing jointly. The exclusion of gain from the sale of a residence can be claimed every two years, provided the taxpayer, number one, owned the property for at least two years during the five years preceding the date of sale, used the property as a principal residence for a total of two years during that five-year period, and has waited two years since the last use of the exclusion for any sale. So what they're saying here in all of this language is that the gain in this example, if this is their primary residence and they're married and they're filing jointly, they don't have to pay tax up to $500,000 of gain. So there would be no capital gains tax as long as they followed these uh, items. So here's what I want you to know. I do want you to know what the exclusions are and then read through this. You're gonna read through this to understand what the primary residence uh, exclusion is, and that's something that I want you to know for the exam. Losses are not deductible, and there are no carryovers of any unused portion of the exclusion. Postponed gains from a previous home sale under the earlier rollover rules reduces the basis of the current home if that home was qualifying replacement home under the old rule. 
All right, so losses are not deductible. There's no carryover of the unused portion. Again, I'm putting it in blue because I just want you to read through it, okay? Now, if there's any changes to the tax code, you want to definitely look at the exclusions at the time that you're going to be watching this. But at the time that I'm going through this piece in this particular text, that was the exclusion. So I want you to learn it as in is if the book is presenting it, but then I want you to back up and do look at the IRS's website when it comes to exclusions, depending on time when y'all are taking this test. Things might change for the better or for the worse, depending on, again, if there's significant changes to the tax code. All right. So that was an analysis of a capital gains analysis for a non-income producing piece of residential property at the sale, going through the capital gains and going through how the, the basis are adjusted and calculated. In the next segment, we're going to go through the analysis of an income producing property and compare and contrast. We're going to look at pre-tax cash flow, tax liability, after-tax cash flow, and then the investment performance with some of the metrics that I think are pretty useful, like the previous metrics of a appreciation that we looked at, appreciation total, and then annual uh, year over year. All right. Okay. Let's take a look at the investment analysis of an income producing property. Let's jump into this. Income properties are those which are held primarily for the generation of income. In addition to commercial and investing uh, investment properties such as office buildings, this category includes residential rental properties as well. All right. So the point of an income property is to generate income. Of the four ways an, an investment can uh, produce yield, uh, income is you know this me prime method or driver. In the residential example that was non-income producing, then we looked at appreciation, leverage, uh, and you know the the tax benefits. So, you know, we're, we we look at in an investment in in under that microscope in the, those different, you know, pillars. But for income producing properties, the prime driver here is income. An important difference between income and non-income properties is that the deductions for depreciation are allowed on income properties. So, let's hit that. Income properties, like non-income properties, generate a gain or a loss on the sale, and they also create an annual income stream. The annual income stream are determined on both a pre-tax and after-tax basis in order to determine productivity of the investment. I think these are blues right there, just to kind of give you a one-time readover. Pre-tax cash flows. Let's talk about it. What is cash flow? You want to know this for the exam, potentially. Cash flow is the difference between the amount of actual cash flowing into the investment as revenue and out of the investment for expenses, debt, and other items. So it's the difference between the amount of actual cash flowing into the investment and cash out in terms of expenses, debt service, and all other items. Cash flow concerns cash items only, and therefore exclude depreciation, which is not a cash expense. So I want you to know depreciation is not a cash expense. Pre-tax cash flow or cash flow before taxation is calculated as following. Potential rental income less any vacancy and collection loss equals the effective rental income. Sometimes they call it the EGI, effective gross income. Plus any other income equals the gross operating income. We definitely want to know this whole formula. You're going to start learning this. Minus any operating expenses, which we'll detail, minus any reserves will give us our net operating income or NOI. Minus any debt service, which is mortgage payments, it's just so you know what debt service is, it's another word for saying a mortgage payment, equals your pre-tax cash flow. Let's detail each of these. Potential rental income first. So first off, what is that? So potential rental income is the annual amount that would be realized if the property were fully leased or rented at a scheduled rate. Vacancy and collection loss is rental income lost because of vacancies or tenant failure to pay rent. Effective rental income is the potential income adjusted for those losses. 
to that and added any other income that the property generates, such as from laundry or parking uh, or anything like that, to obtain gross operating income. Operating expenses paid by the landlord include such items as utilities and maintenance. These are deducted from the gross operating income. Some owners set aside a cash reserve each year to build up a fund for capital replacements in the future. So, for example, to replace a roof or a furnace, we might set aside a little money. Those are called reserves. Cash reserves are not deductible for tax purposes until spent as a deductible repair or maintenance. The remainder is net operating income, or NOI. When the annual amount paid for debt service, including the principal and interest, is subtracted, the remainder is pre-tax cash flow. So you're going to go through this, read through it, and understand this flow. For instance, a small office building of 3,500 square feet rents at $20 per square foot. If fully rented, the annual in rental income would be $70,000. Historically, the property averages $4,200 in vacancy and collection losses. Equipment rentals will provide an additional $2,000 per year in income. The owner will have to pay operating expenses accounting to $10 per square foot or $35,000 per year. The owner sets aside $1 per square foot or $3,500 per year for reserves. The owner financed the purchase of the building with a loan that required annual debt service in the amount annual, debt service in the amount of $20,000. The pre-tax cash flow for the building is illustrated in the following exhibits. We take all of those numbers and we throw it into figure 18.2. First off, the potential rental income, that price per square foot and the amount of square footage, we figured $70,000. Vacancy, they figured $4,200 for collection and losses. You subtract that from potential rental income. That would be 100%. That equals our effective rental income. Okay, let's take a look at Exhibit 18.2, the pre-tax cash flow of the example that we were just talking about. So first off, the potential rental income in that example above was $70,000. That was price per square foot times the rent. Less any vacancy collections. The book gave us an example of $4,200 for vacancy or collection losses. On practice exam questions, they might give you a percentage and you have to just figure that number out of this rent uh, and uh, then subtract that out. Then you get your effective rental income. Sometimes they call it EGI, effective gross income. Then we add any and all other income sources to this number and we get our gross operating income. And in this example, it was $67,800. Okay. Then we subtract out operating expenses. They might just give you a percentage of operating expenses. They might detail them. So just be, pay attention. Now, they, a trick that they might do sometimes is they might include a debt service number in, and I want you to know that debt service is not an operating expense. Mortgage payments are not operating expenses, all right? So you just want to know that. That gets added in later, as you can see down here. So we get out the operating expenses and then we subtract out reserves. In their example, they said the uh, the uh, owner has a dollar per square foot. So you have to multiply it out, uh, easy enough, 3,500 bucks. It was 3,500 square feet. Uh, and we figured that out. So 10% for operating expenses and 1% for the uh, reserves. You, uh, you take all of those numbers after you subtract all those items out and you get your net operating income. In this example, it was $29,300 of NOI. Then we can back out the debt service, which is the mortgage payment, which is $20,000, and our pre-tax cash flow is $9,300, okay? So $9,300 after expenses, pre-tax cash flows. Now, let's talk about the tax liability. The owner's tax liability on taxable income from the property is based on taxable income rather than cash flow. Taxable income and tax liability are calculated the following way. All right, so we know what our, our cash flow was, pre-tax cash flow, but let's take a look at our tax liability, how that's calculated. So we take the net operating income, the NOI, we add back the reserves, we subtract interest expenses, principal isn't deductible, minus any depreciation or cost recovery expenses, and that's going to give us our taxable income. So again, one of the main benefits of owning investment property is the advantage of cost recovery. That was, we found out about earlier, we can deduct that amount, again, over that 27 and a half years, if it's uh, residential, uh, and if it's sort of a non-residential non, non -residential property, uh, it would be 39 years. 
And that gives us our taxable income times whatever tax rate we're at is our tax liability. So this is how do we calculate the tax liability of this particular item? All right, so taxable income is the net operating income minus all allowable deductions. Cost recovery expenses is allowed as a deduction, while allowances for reserves and payments on loan principal payback are not allowed. Thus, since reserves were deducted from gross operating income to determine the NOI, this amount must be added back in. As only the interest portion of debt service is deductible, the principal amount must be removed from the debt service payments and the interest expenses deducted from the NOI. Taxable income multiplied by the owner's marginal tax bracket gives us the tax liability. Not on the tax rate, when a rental property is owned as an individual or by ways of a pass-through entity, a partnership, LLC treated as a partnership for tax purposes, or an S-corp, its net income is taxed at the individual's personal marginal income tax rate. The next exhibit shows the tax liability for the previous example using an individual tax rate of 24%. And again, I'm just going to have you read through this in blue. This means, blue means read through it like one time. You don't need to know how to do this you know, heavy duty analysis for your exam. But let's take a look at that. Exhibit 18.3, here's the tax liability. Figured out net operating income is $29,300 from above. We add back the reserves of $3,500 and the interest expenses were $10,000. The way they figured that out is they separated the principal payments from the interest payments, all right? So that you'll see in the math section inside of your math work. You'll see that there. But then in this example, they just came up with $10,000 of interest. And the depreciation that they were able to look at based off of this number is $22,000, which gives us a taxable income of $800. Now, if the owner's ta marginal tax rate was 28%, then the tax liability is $192. So do you see what we just did here? I mean, check this out. This is crazy. We have a pre-tax cash flow of $9,300, but that's not the taxable portion. We have to go and do some of this work here adding back the reserves, subtracting out interest. We can still write out the cost expenses and depreciation. And as you can see, depreciation is a big deal when it comes down to tax liability. So we go through this. When we readjust, that gives us a tax liability of only $192. That's pretty crazy, right? After. So that's something I just want to keep in blue so you can check it out. And then let's talk about after-tax cash flow. After-tax cash flow is the amount of income from the property that actually goes into the owner's pocket after income taxes are paid. It is figured as your pre-tax cash flow minus your tax liability equals your after-tax cash flow. The after-tax cash flow for the sample property is illustrated in the following exhibit. So we had a pre-tax cash flow of $9,300, the tax liability of $224. Our after-tax cash flow is $9,076. All right. Now, when we come back, I want to get into investment performance, and we're going to go and uh, check that out. And with investment performance, it's a means of measuring how our investments are doing. And there are some key performance indicators that I want to go over, the classic ones that I think you all ought to just know. Uh, and again, remember, for the purposes of the exam, we need to know, to know the basics. How do I get to from potential gross income to uh, you know a, a, a net operating income? What's a operating expense? How do I subtract that out? Uh, how do I apply a capitalization rate? So, so we don't need to know this heavy in-depth for tax purposes. But understanding how it's calculated and how this whole thing works, that's some magical stuff. So I want you to go through this unit even after you've completed this kind of a course so that you can get a bearing on how these things work, right? All right, so I will see you in the next example. All right, so we are back. Um, we're about to get into investment performance. And before that, I just wanted to point something out. There was a tax liability thing in the previous example. Uh, and it looks like there was just a typo. I just wanted to point that out. In the initial sort of um, exhibit, 18.3, the tax liability was $192. And the tax liability here listed as $224. You know, and I just want to make sure that we were clean about that. <clears throat> just to make sure. 
And the way we would do that is we would just basically go taxable income of $800, and we want a 28% tax liability. So right here, this number is incorrect. This number here, this 192, for those that were just keeping track, it's really 224. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that you saw that. It's been corrected here in the book. But for anybody that's, you know, astute and kind of catching this trick, uh, there was a typo here. So we found a typo in the book. Just wanted to make sure that you knew that. All right, so let's get into investment performance. And in this particular section, these are the key performance indicators that we typically look to when we're trying to quantify success in investing in real property. All right, so first off, investors measure the investment performance of an income property in many different ways, depending on their needs. A few of the more common measures are, number one, return on investment, ROI. So we take the price and the net operating income, and that gives us the return on investment. The next one is cash on cash return. And we take the cash invested and the cash flow and we get our cash on cash return. And then the cash flow and equity will give us our return on equity based off of the cash flow, right? So ROE as well. And these are the more popular ones that you tend to see in you know, I would say in the business. Um, so, you know, it, I, it wouldn't hurt to just memorize these as you're kind of playing around here. Um, I would say that that's probably not a bad idea. You just so that you can make sure that you're sort of getting these. Um, I would say, let's put these in blue. Because I don't know how important it is for your exam. So I'm going to do that. Okay. Other measures of return use the processes of discounted cash flow. Now, this model is something you don't need to know for your exam, but it's a pretty useful model. Uh, these methods, chief, uh, chief of which is probably the internal rate of return, requires an estimate of projected after-tax proceeds from the sale of the property. A licensee who does not have the expertise necessary for these more complicated measures should refer clients to a qualified investment expert. So when we're dealing with discounted cash flow models uh, and, and looking at the internal rate of return, I would stay sort of, you don't need to know it for this exam, period. Uh, and then b beyond that, I would start looking at it and getting into it. But if you don't, if you're asked about it and you're not sure in the profession, then I would uh, I would more uh, want to see you um, steer someone towards a qualified investment expert. That's probably the better place to be. But then, you know, I would certainly say, start to learn these models and they're going to help you tremendously once you get into the business. All right. All right. That crushes unit 18. One of my favorite units, my favorite, one of my favorite topics. Uh, and then we're going to get into the snapshot review for unit 18 coming up next. Okay. So we've got the snapshot review unit number 18, real estate investments. The first thing we looked at was some investment fundamentals, investment characteristics, the greater the risk, the higher the expected return. Some investments require more investor involvement than others, more active versus passive. Some investments are more liquid convertible to cash than others. And we learned that real estate is highly illiquid. Some of the rewards of investing. Investors seek to increase wealth through four main channels. What are the rewards? Income, appreciation, leverage, and tax benefits. Memorize them. Some of the risks. Changes in the supply and demand for an investment, there's market risk. There's changes in business, which, businesses which, uh, with which the investment is connected to. That's business risk. Changes in the value of money, purchasing power risk. And the changes in interest rates, that's financial risk. So these are your risks. I would look at and memorize rewards and risks. Those are pretty easy. Then we looked at the different types of investments. Among investors, choices of investments are money, things like CDs, equity, Example would be stocks. Debt would be things like bonds and mortgages. And real estate, which is income and non-income producing properties. Looking more microscopically at real estate as an investment, again, we look at the analysis of risk versus reward. 
We find that real estate investors must weigh the potential risk and returns inherent in market variability, expected versus real income, use of borrowing or leverage, changes in the tax treatment of capital gains and income, and the cost of capital. How expensive is money? Illiquidity. Real estate is generally less liquid than other investment types. It takes time to market a property. Oftentimes in real estate, management requirements are pretty significant. Real estate tends to be require more investor involvement than other investments do. Uh, maintenance, management, operations, compare that to buying a share of some big publicly traded company, uh, and it's quite different in terms of management requirements. Then we define what are some of these different investment entities. The first and easiest way is direct, buying a property and taking responsibility. Then there's a syndicate or partnership. A group of investors pool their resources to buy, develop, and or operate the property. We define what REIT stands for, a real estate investment trust. This is something I definitely think you'll see. Real estate investment trusts, investors buy certificates in a trust that invest in mortgages or other real estate and receive income according to shares that they own. At least 75% of all proceeds have to be paid out to its partners. 75% of the assets being held is, needs to be real estate. Real estate mortgage investment conduits, REMIC, I would just know what it stands for. Investors hold residual or regular interest in an entity that holds a pool of mortgages secured by real property. Then we started to talk about the taxation of real estate investments, taxable income, gross income received minus allowable expenses, deductions, and exclusions. And we learned all about the world of cost recovery, also known as depreciation, which is a deduction of a portion of the property's value from the gross income each year over the life of the asset. And we learned that the life of a residential asset is 27 and a half years. And then in a non-residential asset, it's 39 years. Anytime we sell an asset, if there is a gain, there's a tax. An excess of proceeds from the sale of a property over the original cost of the property subject to adjustments. Interest. Mortgage interest is deductible from the annual gross income from a property subject to limitations. Passive activities, business activities in which the taxpayer does, no, does not materially participate, including interest in limited partnerships and rental activities. Losses from such activities can be used to offset income from other passive activities. Then we took a peek of an investment analysis of residential property, and we learned about what is appreciation, is an increase in value of an asset over time. Maybe stated as a difference between the original price and the current market value, or as a percentage increase over the original price, not a true measure of the investment's return. Deductibles. For non-income properties, primary tax benefit is the annual deduction for mortgage interest. The tax liabilities we learned, the seller of a principal residence owes taxes on any capital gains that results from the sale unless excluded. Capital gains is defined as the amount realized minus the adjusted basis, and we took a look at some examples. We learned about a tax exclusion up to $250,000 if you're single and up to $500,000 if you're married and filing jointly can be excluded from capital gains every two years. We looked at an investment analysis of an income property and learned what pre-tax cash flow was. The annual pre-tax cash flow is net operating income minus the debt service. Then the tax liability on income from a property is based on taxable income, which is the net operating income minus any interest expenses and cost recovery. Then we looked at the after-tax cash flow. The annual after-tax cash flow is pre-tax cash flow minus the tax liability. And then we looked at and learned about a couple of different investment performance metrics. A few common measures of investment performance are return on investment, net operating income divided by price, cash on cash return, which is cash flow divided by cash invested, return on equity, ROE is cash flow divided by equity. And then we talked briefly about discounted cash flow analysis and the internal rate of return, of which all of these are fairly complicated and you will not have to be able to calculate these for a basic real estate exam. But you should read through these and at least start getting a 
you know, putting these in your ear, sticking them in your brain, you know, thinking about them. Uh, and as you get more and more advanced, I would start saying the more advanced practitioner is going to understand how these metrics work. And if nothing else, you'll be able to quantify and calculate these for your own investments, just so that you are aware of its performance, which at the end of the day, it's all about measuring the data that you have and it's the data. The data never lies. The data will tell you if you've got a good investment. There is no feel, you know, in 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 our world of investments. Uh, it's not for an investor. You shouldn't feel or think like or uh, I'm I'm feeling like none of that stuff. It's math. Literally, it's math. Do the math does the math work? Do the numbers work? How do the numbers look? What are the numbers? And if you are able to disseminate that information to a professional, then they can help you advance that significantly. But if you're lacking the awareness of those numbers and you're playing this game by feeling, then you're making a huge mistake as an investor. Investors are pragmatic and they are very level-headed uh, about what's going on. At least the successful ones are. The emotional ones tend to not do as well, right? So uh, that's just a little food for thought as you're getting in now that you have your sort of investor wings and uh, uh, by completing this particular section. I will see you in some of the practice questions coming up next.